Thanks so much for joining us today, Sharif. It's <laughs> awesome to have you with us. So Sharif is a distinguished product manager at Atlassian, um, and we met each other in December last year um, mm -hmm. at Agile Oz. So it was the first in-person conference that I've been to in many, many years. Um, and it was awesome, Sharif was speaking there, and it was so awesome to meet you and to hear you talk. Um, yeah, so welcome, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jerome, and the Easy Agile team. Very exciting. I, I just found out today that you went to Wollongong Uni. Yes, I uh, I studied uh, computer science at Wollongong. Used to do the drive from um, uh, kind of southwest Sydney, where I'm from. So uh, enjoyed many many drives down there and uh, trips to, up and down Manusley, and uh, absolutely loved Wollongong. So just recently spent the summer there the holidays there. So for, for listeners on the call, you guys, uh, most of Easy Agile, is all of Easy Agile down at well, the Wollongong area or yeah, south coast of Australia? One, yeah. of us, one of us is up in Sydney, but yeah, okay. that's, I had no idea you studied computer science. I thought for some reason, I just thought you were always like a um, businessy person, but I guess I guess maybe that's where we should start now. <laughs> yeah, now I learned really... that one. I learned, yeah, I learned that I wasn't a great computer scientist that way, yes. <laughs> so maybe let's, maybe let's start there. Like how, how did that work? Go. I assume that you started off as an engineer at some point. How did you end up where you are now? Like, give us the headlines. Yeah, uh, it's a, been a weird journey. Uh, the the short version of the journey is, uh, yeah, loved working with computers and programming back in the day. In and at the end of school, in university, a friend of mine ran a a business building websites before you could, you know, there were all these website builders and you could make a business out of it. So. We were coding on the top of his dad's house um, and I was studying at university at the same time and uh, kind of balancing both. Uh, so, and then went to university full time, finished my degree uh, and then uh, I guess got a job uh, coding. And um, I think a year or two into it, I kind of realized I probably, you know, I think I realized a bit of this during university. I loved building things and then being involved in the process of, of solving a problem and finding a solution to the problem. Uh, but I just wasn't a great engineer. Uh, like I was one of those engineers, if there are any engineers listening on the call, they'd be like, it works, don't touch it. We don't need to make it any better. Just just, just leave it, it works. Um, yeah, so I did engineering, like I did a, mostly a software engineering role for five or six years out of university. Um, and cut a long story short, I, uh, I, uh, was a, I still am a, an Atlassian fanboy, I guess I had seen, we had used Atlassian products in uh, the company I was working at. I had seen how, uh, it was, some of their products transformed how we work, um, in particular around, uh, opening up our company. Um, and, uh, and I was fascinated about the business model this company had created, like, there's this phrase that people throw out there now, product-led growth. I, I think Atlassian, I mean, this is before my time, effectively, to my knowledge, is the first company that's kind of did that, um, where uh, didn't have a sales team, didn't really have an option back then, um, and the product sold itself. Uh, and so I was fascinated about the business model. I'd read a few blogs about Atlassian and the business model, and I had uh, someone who was running product at Atlassian, Audra Ng, who's still around uh, in, in Sydney today, um, uh, she reached out to me and said, oh, you know, you seem interested and think deeply about our products. Would you be interested in a product management role? Long story short, I replied and was like, well, actually, I, I, I looked up in our job seeker websites in Australia. I searched for product manager, and this was probably more than 13 years ago now, 12 and a bit years ago, and there were zero search results. And I was like, what, what the hell is this role? And I replied to her, I was like, yeah, I'd love to work for you guys. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a great engineer, so I'm pretty sure I couldn't get an engineering job. <laughs> I like being involved in products, and I in my email, I think I replied and said, "What the, what is a product manager? <laughs> it's a great start to a job interview." Um, so yeah, we just went through the process, and I kind of learned to uh, learned product management on the job. Uh, from very lucky to have the Atlassian founders as you know, kind of mentors and guides, and a whole bunch of people at Atlassian. And then also lucky that a lot of our customers today are product managers too. So I get to interview them about how they build products and learn about their style of product management. So that's how I fell into it. It was totally by accident. Never heard yeah, of it yeah. before. It's, it's um, really exciting, yeah. I think. And um, it's funny because, yeah, I think I mentioned in December, like I, I'm sort of in that sort of 
in that zone where I feel like maybe it's something that I want to do and maybe it's a transition that could be coming up in the next quarter or so. So it's very exciting and it does feel very, um, it's weird because I, I've, I've been reading a lot of product management um, material lately and like the, the thing that I keep hearing about is how new we, we are as an industry mm. or how new it is as a role. Like 10 years ago, maybe, maybe it didn't exist. Maybe there were no roles. Um, but maybe, maybe this is a good question. Like maybe, could you tell us what you think a product manager is by definition? Yeah, this is super hard. Um, uh, apparently I'm half famous from my YouTube video on this topic and this was, uh, I recall uh, doing a flight from Sydney to San Francisco and uh, one of the Jira software product managers, uh, product marketers said, hey, there seems to be a lot of demand around what is product management searching on YouTube? Do you want to create a video for it? And I was like, oh, really? And so I wrote this script on the plane on the way from Sydney to San Francisco, landed, got off the plane, was desperate for a shower, the showers weren't working in the office, and we recorded a video of just this, you know, five minute video. But, um, you know, I think it's really hard to answer that succinctly, uh, but I would summarize for most medium to large organizations, uh, a product manager job is someone who um, works with uh, uh, customers and, and internal teams to balance uh, and find uh, work with the team to build a shared understanding of the customer's problems, what solutions you might build and help the team execute and you know, build a solution to that. The hard part of that role is um, in growing organizations is largely bringing the team along in the journey. Uh, in smaller organizations, you'll find a product manager is doing a lot of generalist type work and getting their hands way more involved in the tactical day to day. In larger organizations, um, you'll find product management is is largely about building a shared brain uh, in within a group of people. And 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 it it's funny because it's still the same job. You're still trying to identify a customer problem, solve it in a sustainable way that's viable for the business and solves the customer problem. But how you do that changes drastically in smaller to larger teams or smaller, larger organizations. Yeah, totally. I think I think something that sort of just stood out um, in what you've just in your last sentence was that this this idea of a shared brain, like what, what, what do you think that what does that mean to you and, and to your teams at Atlassian? Yeah, I, I, um, for me, it's it's the mo one of the most powerful tools to build products at scale. And so, what I've learned over the years, uh, and I've given a talk about this, where I, I had th I had thought the role of a product manager was to make all the decisions on the product, and and that might work for a startup uh, or a small team. Um, and you find over time, as you get to twenty people, even just uh, twenty people you find the the best way to achieve the customer outcome and the business outcome is actually to empower others with the same context that you have. And the classic example I give is like, hey, we're, you know, hi, I'm from Atlassian, the makers of Jira. And then I'll usually insert a Jira joke here where I apologize for all the Jira feedback that I might have. And we're, we have lots of teams trying to make that better. Um, uh, but, you know, it's something that pains me as a product manager is seeing the amount of product managers that are in their Jira backlogs that are dragging and dropping individual stories up and down the priority list. And granted, I think most product managers will have to start doing that at some point in their career or, or, or maybe it's a life cycle. Every time you join a new project, you might have to get your hands dirty and then whatever. And I always say to those folks, your job as a product manager, there's some context that you have in your head that lets you decide that this is more important than that. Or, you know, and what is that context? It's it's probably context from three areas, the customer context, the product vision context, or the business context. Like, you know, you know about how your business needs to operate, or, you know, you know, some detail about a customer problem, or, you know, where you're headed. Those three contexts that you have, the best way you can scale yourself and build and scale product teams is by empowering engineers and other people in your team with those three contexts so that they can make those decisions on which card should go before which card. And you can zoom out a bit and align more on the broader strategy, the goals for the sprint, rather than the tactical um, scrum mastery type of work, which I always tell people is not a bad thing. And it's not like you're more important than other people and you shouldn't do that. Sometimes you just got to help your team out and do whatever you need to do. But in reality, mo most engineers don't want to be told what to do. They, they want to be involved in a process and build something meaningful. And, and if you think about those three contexts and why 
you you can put one card over another card or why you think that you know this is the problem we should solve next that context and the shared brain has to expand from your head to your whole team's head to your even your stakeholders um, to some degree in, in larger organizations so it's just a very important tool in a pm's toolbox to scale themselves um, and it's the only way i've managed to do it sustainably mm. yeah totally and I mean, it's something me as an engineer currently, it's something I, I, I also really appreciate. And like, it's something I would say to, to our product uh, managers here, to Tegan and to Elizabeth, like I'm the kind of engineer that likes context. Give me context as soon as you can early so that I can think about it and I can bounce ideas off it, um, off, you know, with you. Um, yeah, so I, I, mm. I, I get that. But from a more practical uh, perspective, like how, how is that done effectively, do you think? Yeah, yeah, um, and I think that's even become more challenging in a remote world as, as uh, more and more teams are going remote first or a remote is a large part of their culture. Um, how it's done is lots of tactics. Um, you know, I think this is where the PM toolbox of frameworks, techniques, and processes help, um, whether it be user journey mapping, uh, whether it be customer interviews and research, whether it be surveys, whether it be analytics and data analysis, uh, whether it be vision setting, um, et cetera. Those are, the, those are the tactics that a product manager learns or improves or frameworks they create on their day-to-day -day job. But doing them as a team rather than as, as just the PM and the designer or just as the PM by themselves is how we bring people along on the journey. And so, you know, one of my goals is to always never do customer research or customer interviews by myself. Sometimes it ends up happening and I'll have to record it and, and share it with my engineers or whatever. But you know, you, my effectiveness, I get 10 times more effectiveness if engineers are in the call or uh, designers are in the call. Um, same thing with vision setting. Like, how do I, how can I do vision setting with a collective group of engineers so that they all feel like they're part of the process? Uh, how can I do, if I'm going to sit here and, and analyze some data and in, in a tool or run some SQL queries or something, how can I do that in a way that brings people along on the journey? If I'm going to do a, a survey, you know, I hate surveys, but sometimes you got to do them. Or if I'm going to um, do some market research, you know, simple example, we were doing some market research the other day of, of tooling that um, solved similar problems. We signed every engineer one of the tools and told them here's the template and go, you know, rather than the PM doing it all. And this is a bit counterintuitive because a lot of people think, wait, wait, that means my engineers are spending less time coding. Coding, yeah. And, and, and there's a bit of tension there where you're like, ah, but they're not picking up tickets off the backlog. Like the engineers are writing decisions now and engineers are like doing market research. What's going on? And I always encourage folks, they're like, you, your, your goal is to build the right thing that solves a particular problem. And the risk in the whole of the process is not is that you actually build the right thing. That's the number one risk in the whole process. So no one ever says in their in their careers, oh, "Man, I wish engineers spent less time understanding context and more time coding." Right? Like the old way of doing it is PMs would write specs and hand it over to engineers. I tell people you should try to avoid writing specs because a spec is an attempt at a shared brain. And sometimes you'll have to write specs. Sometimes you'll get to a period of your product where, uh, I mean, you're probably going through this, Jerome, as well. You work on a few easy agile products, right? And the product gets more complex and there's more edge cases to think about. And so someone needs to put pen to paper and think about it. But the spec solves the problem of a shared brain. And it's a one way to solve it. But you mean now historically that's never worked or it hasn't worked as effective as it could be. Um, and so then how can we build, uh, bring other people on the journey? I'm guessing you've felt this too, Jerome, right? Like in those, I, have. Yeah. I feel that deeply, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's not even funny. Like in a, on a day to day, it's actually quite frustrating um, sometimes. But I think you've, you've hit a nerve for me. Um, so I think one of the reasons that really held me back from ever going after a product role or changing, um, changing, transitioning away from an engineer is because there is this vibe. I get this vibe that the most valuable skill that I bring is code. And that's, I, it's really, it's been like a bit of a, like a blocker sometimes, cause I feel mm. like I can't try anything new or like people are sort of hesitant to give me new tasks um, because cause I am a coder, cause I'm an effective coder. It's like people value that so much that it holds me back sometimes. Um, mm. So it is, it's a really interesting, um, 
point. Uh, and for you, Jerome, and I guess in your mind, are you thinking, well, if I'm hired as a coder, my job's to code. And then, the, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, there's a, then in your mind, you go, well, how do I become a better coder? There is Excel at the engineering aspect, which I think, you know, we'll need different types of engineers to do that as well, like performance and scale or accessibility, or, or you may be a specialist in a type of language or a, or a, or a you know, front end, back end. But there's also build the thing better for the customer. And that's another way to Excel, right? Yeah, totally. But I think, I think this is just my personal opinion that I feel like the way we sort of define success for engineers is very much, you know, this sprint, we're going to hit this and we're going to hit these bigger goals mm -hmm. over these sprints. And as an engineer, it's very, I feel like it's, we don't often always get the time to think or be involved in these bigger, bigger topics with the PMs or the designers, for example, because we're very much focused on just getting things done mm. um, and hitting these, these goals. Um, which I think is a shame because because this shared brain idea is is powerful. I think especially when you especially when you look around at an engineering team, there's there's often so much talent that's not necessarily and so much experience that's not directly related to code. Um, like I used to work with like engineers in Germany that were like um, they used to build rockets, for example, and one was a baker and one used to be an artist, and mm. there's a whole room of people with so much experience in such a different perspective um, that it, I feel like it's a waste if you, if you don't sort of tap into that as a shared brain. Um, yeah, definitely. We, we, we actually last week we did a um, Mary marketing lead for one of our products. She ran a what we call a builder box exercise. People can Google it. Uh, Google it. Builder box is a, is a framework. There's lots of them out there for um, how we will frame a particular improvement or a product to our customers, how we'll message it. Think of it as like when you open up your app store on your phone, in three screenshots, you sort of get what the app does and there's three value propositions or whatever. And the engineers were involved in that experience. So they were involved, you know, it took time out of the day to, to write text on, you know, we did a digital lease, we did it in Mural or whatever, and go, okay, if we were to ship this as a product, like what's on the front of the box and like, you know, and as a team, the shared brain aha moment we had is actually that's, you know, that's going to change our roadmap. You know, typically people do that. We're finished building the thing. How do we market it? And then engineers being involved in that process are now thinking, well, hang on a second. The story would be so much more powerful if this changed, like, or if we actually talked about the feature this way, not that way. Or, and as a consequence of that, we're now changing our roadmap. And engineers that were involved in that brainstorming activity are now better equipped to think about and make my, make the decisions in the day-to-day -day feature they're working on, how are they going to make trade-offs on, you know, exceptions and edge cases and how might the experience work with their designer. And so um, I think, you know, involving those people there, it's, it's just, it's just has a huge impact. Um, and you're right. The balance there is like, you know, as a team, um, you know, I'm currently working on a new product at Atlassian. I think you're probably seeing this today. You know, I, I saw this at the tail end of my time when I used to work on Confluence, but it seemed like a lot of teams were moving away from strict sprints to more using the sprint ritual as a as a point of check in, less about did we hit last week's goals or not, as more as rigid as it used to be. Now it's it's very much you know the classic Yumahi Scrum ban, which is like we set a high level goal for that week and how did we go for that week? Is it are you seeing the same trend? Um, <laughs> I think it really depends on the team and yeah, sort of like okay. what the business is doing. Like in a previous role, we had a, like a, we had nine months to, to get this, this online checkout live. And we, we, it was very much like, we need to get this done before this so that we hit these, these milestones. So I think it is, I think it really depends on the team. Mm. So, so maybe I can pick your brain. I've got so many questions for you and I think it's, um, it's just crazy that you've, 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 I feel like you've gone down a similar path as me. Um, so in those early days when you were switching from, from development to, to product, how, how did you go about doing it? Because maybe, maybe I'll share something first. So I'm, I, as I'm going through this transition now, like I'm, the thing that I really am not enjoying about it so far is that it's not as when I'm approaching a problem as an engineer, I'll, I'll often know what to do and I know how to do it. It's, it's mm. very clearly defined. The ways to get there are defined. 
Whereas in product, I feel like there's no clear way to get anywhere mm. or to answer any question. It's sort of, how, how did you approach that in your early days? Yeah, I remember uh, switching from engineering and hopefully folks listening, maybe there's engineers wanting to switch or, or do more PM work are feeling the same. Just feeling this endless pool of work and then feeling unbounded with how to approach something and then the anxiety associated, like, well, I could do yes. market research, but I could just do market research forever. Like, like, it just, like, does, like, when do I actually stop, right? Like, the definition of done is like, it's, it's endless. There is no, you know, you know, I actually found the transition quite stressful because I, I felt like there's in every area of a PM's life, you feel like there is a never ending pool of work. Whereas, you know, I think engineering is probably the same. There's always code you can clean up, whatever. But when the task is done, as I, as I felt it, it was like, it was done. Yes, it was improvements, but I could, I could clearly um, box the time I spent on things. Um, and I, I think this touches the heart of the PM role, which is making effective, efficient, and the right trade-off calls. Because you're doing that with, you're making trade-off calls day-to-day -day with working with engineering design, uh, you know, marketing, trying to balance everyone's needs, and most importantly, meet the customer problem and then deal with your stakeholders. And you're, so you're, you're always, the PM role is largely balancing a bunch of trade-offs. You know, I used to use this phrase, a roadmap is effectively, um, the roadmap to your products is effectively a sequence of decisions that you've made. Like you, you've, you've said no to other stuff, so you've put other themes to work on in your roadmap. Um, but that feeling of lostness is really hard because you just, what, what do I do? And it, it's, you know, I found that quite hard. I drowned quite a bit in it. I, I still go through these moments where you're just like, oh man, I could spend forever on this. So I think that's one aspect of the lostness I think you're describing. I hope folks feel well, that's how I felt too. And the other aspect is like, how do I go about doing my job was the other one. So this never ending pool was one problem. So like I could do market research forever or I could do customer interviews forever. And then the other pool was like, like, you know, what's the frameworks I go about doing my job? Like, is there a tactic or a template I'm supposed to follow? And 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 that goes there. I think with the the never ending pool thing, the way I've I've managed to solve it is is to try to help me know, uh, help me constantly reset what is the most important thing I could be doing for my team today. And to this day, I ask my question that on a regular basis. So, example, I might do a series of customer interviews. At some point, I've got some learnings we've shared together as a team, whatever. And you realize that's no longer the most important thing. And now there's like something else I need to work on that's the most important thing. So you always, you're always dropping balls as a PM, if you use the juggling analogy. You, your, your job is to work out which ball you should catch next. And the only tactic I've found to solve that first problem is constantly asking myself, asking myself, have I done enough of that thing? Or is there something else that's popped up that's more important? And it's just a, it's a discipline. It's like every day you come in, I rewrite, um, call me old school, but I, let me just pull up my book for the audiences watching the video at home. For those listening to the audio, you won't experience this, but um, uh, I, I kind of rewrite my my to-do list on a on a regular basis, probably every two days. I literally rewrite my to-do list and things drop off all the time. Um, and I think that's how I've solved that first problem. The second problem with the like, how do I go about doing discovery? I've come to learn over the years, you know, m my uh, VP of product, Joff Redfern, has a framework, uh, folks can Google it, that it's called the PM Craft Triangle. Uh, I've written a blog about it. There's different styles of discovery that people naturally lead towards from their their backgrounds, their tendencies, or their styles. You know, he comes up, he has a simple framework, but there's a few other PM type frameworks, which is artist, scientist, general manager. So it's about the different approaches to discovery. Neither of these edges of the framework are, are bad. It's just what are you good at and how do you use that to do your discovery and how to balance yourself so that other people can be involved. As an example, I am very much an artist. When you read the framework, I'm very much an artist side uh, style approach to product management. What does that mean? I'm way more vision led than I am data led. Uh, I'm way more on beliefs and bets than I am on um, actuals, right? I'm actually terrible at it to be, you know, I've learned over the years, I'm a terrible growth product manager, like someone who's trying to optimize a funnel, uh, you know, or uh, improve a single metric. Like that's, I'm actually really bad at that. Like, uh, you know, my strengths are more on, on, on creation of new value 
and identifying potential opportunities. And therefore, my styles or my frameworks or my practices are slightly different to an engineer who's more on the scientist side of the spectrum. Um, so long way of saying is I'd encourage folks listening to find um, a framework that works for them on styles of product management. Um, I would, you know, if you're looking for one out there right now, I could tell you just Google the PM craft triangle, you'll find Joff's article or my article on it. And depending on your style, you'll take a different approach to discovery and there's different frameworks and approaches to doing things. Um, and so you'll then look up different frameworks appropriate to your style, or you'll just create your own and just discover it as you go, right? Yeah. I tried this method for this thing. It wasn't that great. We stopped using that. We use this other one and we prefer that more. Yeah. yeah. As, but when I talk to PMs, this is this is what I tend to tend to hear um, is that, oh, like that didn't work for me. So I just do this like spreadsheet on Google Docs. Yeah. And it's what, what I do. And so I'm, I'm feeling like it's clear as mud, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to engineering, where I know things work and I know how to get there, so, but it, I think that's part of the the, the adventure. Hey, um, maybe uh, like I'm curious now, like how now that Atlas is so big, I feel like you maybe have more data points. I feel like I'm more database here. Yeah. Um, where are you finding the PMs are coming from? Are they do they tend to be coming from technology like me, like from engineering, or are they? I, like a lot of our PMs here are from marketing. Like, mm -hmm. where are they coming from, from your perspective? Look, histo there's, uh, the, the historically, there's a lot of, um, uh, I think a lot of companies will say, our oh, computer science is required for in p product management, et cetera. And the truth is, as always, the classic PM answer is, I, th I think it depends. Um, uh, I think if you make a generalization, the bulk of the observations I've seen have come from a, a business information systems, computer science background, et cetera. Um, you know, when I was at university, there was no option to study this line, but you kind of, if you went down the business path, you were doing similar things. Yeah. And I think now there's more deliberate courses that are lined up and a lot of universities are adapting their curriculum uh, to, to adopt this. So, um, you know, I think some people are more coming in straight with the assumption they want a product management's job and they know what that is. So we hire a lot of business uh, graduates, business IT graduates, that go straight into our associate product manager program, as an example. On the flip side, we have some incredible product managers at Lassian that have zero, zero technical background. Uh, our Trello team, I think, was our team with the most product managers with the least technical background. We had philosophy backgrounds, arts backgrounds, mathematics backgrounds, uh, so completely different. But I think more traditionally, if people move to product management, I, in, in my experience and especially Atlassian's experience, we have about or close to 300 product managers now, is they've come from um, a team that's close to the product manager. So marketing, switching to product management is common. Uh, I think what I've seen most common is engineering to product management because your engineering also, your job is to identify a solution to a problem and build the solution to the problem. So you're thinking problem solution a lot in your role. Um, uh, I've seen design switch to product management, not as common. I have seen that uh, common. I've more seen product managers move to design, <laughs> um, uh, wannabe designers, which is a running joke. Um, so that's another common trend. So you often, you know, see one of those three falling into it. I think if I were to make some generalizations at Alassian, our probably most common path internally is for engineering to PM. But we have had marketing to PM, we've had design to PM. I think we've had support to PM as well, um, customer success to PM a few times. Um, again, a lot of problem solution mindset. Uh, falling into product management, people say, how do I go get a product management job or how do I get into it? Um, lots of advice here, but if you're working in a medium to large organization, internal transfers are your best uh, approach because you try it in a safe environment, you're already familiar with the cultural context of the organization. Product management looks different company to company because culture, how we do work, looks different company to company. So you have to adapt to that culture and move work forward and align your stakeholders and align your internal teams. Uh, I think that's an option thing, uh, awesome thing to do. The other thing I tell people is think of everything you do as a product manager and then frame your resume as, as a product manager, like if you think about it. So. I, I firmly believe, I only discovered this, you know, last year and I've been married to my wife for many years. I think she's basically doing a product management job. So my wife works for a local council or for the American listeners, a county, if you like. 
And um, she's like a strategic project officer. And you're like, well, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. But when I listened to her day-to-day -day work, she could frame that completely in a product management role. So um, she works with residents in, in, in some suburbs to understand their needs, then works with our transport planners uh, and our road builders to work out cycleways and pathways and where they should go. Then they come up with proposals and get feedback sessions from their residents, right? You can frame, you know, then they've got to balance that with internal stakeholders, the, you know, uh, local members of parliament that are pushing different agendas, right? Everyone's got their pet features. There are so many parallels you can draw with everything you do to building a product. Um, so think of what you're doing as a product. You might have a funnel, you may have customers, you may have stakeholders, something you need to build. You can frame a lot of your experiences that way. Yeah, totally. And I think, yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree, actually. I feel, I feel like most engineers, I think a lot of engineers, maybe there's like a subset of engineers that, <laughs> that actually do behave in this way. And it's actually how I found you, um, how I heard about you the first time. Um, so I, for, for the listeners, I first heard of Sharif, it must have been 2019, I was living in Munich at the time, and I was, I was being given these tasks by our PO, and I was like, I was wondering, like, why are you giving this to me? Like, I thought it would be, um, I felt like it would be something the senior, we had like a staff level engineer on the team, like very lucky, he was excellent, technically brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, and I just assumed it was something that he should be doing or something he, probably something more that he would do. And um, the PO actually was like, no, I just feel like it's the kind of engineer that you are. And then he sent me a link to your um, your blog post about product engineers, mm. um, which was very, very fascinating. And it sort of validated um, like a way forward for me, mm -hmm. uh, a way forward of working, um, which is very exciting. Um, so. Did you want to have a chat, a quick chat? I feel like we're going to run out of time soon, but do you want to have a quick chat about, about that blog post? Because I found it so mm. helpful and I was having a chat to one of the grads here the other day, yesterday actually. Um, she also read it and she watched your video and she, she also felt um, identified with that persona that you wrote about. Mm. Did, did you want to talk about what you think a product engineer is and how they can help in the product space? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... I've had a lot of people talk to me about that post. I, I can't say, so I, I, I heard of this term from our uh, former VP of engineering, Jean-Michel, who um, just came off actually running engineering at Shopify for many years. And I was on this flight with him from Sydney to um, San Francisco, too many flights of those for me, but, and we were reflecting, I was sitting next to him, the poor guy didn't know how much I could talk. Um, but I was uh, reflect, we were trying to reflect on what worked well in some product teams and why some product, some product teams were better than others or seemed to perform better. And there were lots of reasons. I'm not claiming at all this is the only reason. But one observation we picked up that I, I felt the urge to codify somehow um, was that a lot of those teams, even though they had product managers on them, whatever, had what he described as, as a product engineer. And I was like, wait, wait what the hell is a product engineer? I never heard that phrase. And it's probably not the best term because I, I think there's an actual, in the Valley, they, they call engineers who work on products product engineers, I, I think, but, but let's go with it for now. And, and he was basically describing um, mini product managers, but someone who's an engineer who is more focused on that. And the analogy we came up with was like, Engineers like the engineers can specialize in a bunch of different things. We can have performance engineers, we can have AI and data science and ML, we can have front end engineers, back end engineers, and they all work on different things. Everyone cares about the product. But one of those attributes which they could do or focus on was um, be more caring more about the customer outcome above all else. And so, you know, I think all engineers desire to do that. I'm not, uh, not saying that, but, it, but to the point where I think that they're always looking for ways to make sure they're building the right thing without actually building the thing. <laughs> so, uh, and, and so we identified several teams at Atlassian, dozens, where it was clear that there was one or two engineers where he or she were almost acting as product managers. They were taking shortcuts where it made sense to take shortcuts uh, from an engineering perspective because of uncertainty or or finding ways to prototype things over actually building it, et cetera. 
Uh, they were challenging their product managers on assumptions the team had made, not in a negative way, but a um, we want I I desire to build the right thing with you. Um, they they were honestly I think in in a, in a whole team there's only one person in the team that's the best at identifying edge cases and identifying quick wins, and it's usually this type of person who is has enough business context that knows what we're trying to do, but is living in the code every day to know that in these scenarios, these don't actually matter. I can totally ignore this. This is going to be edge case. But also be like, well, if this is what we're trying to do, there is this quick win we can build because they know the how. I wouldn't say that's ever a PM's job, but which actually gets to a better solution to the problem. And, and so effectively, we created this phrase, product engineers. Um, and I it didn't exist out there. And I often find with these things like, if someone puts out the terminology out there, people can can debate it and discuss it and in the community. And and I just felt it was something we had to do, uh, like to codify because it was a cultural thing that we we saw helped us scale. We have P, we have te we have teams at Alaskan where I would say the leader of the team is probably a product engineer from a vision and a driven perspective, and there's a PM playing a support role because the PM scaling themselves well. They're focusing on other teams, right? I think the more product engineers we have as any company, the better you will scale, like uh, uh, completely. Um, it's very hard to hire product managers, and you know we I've been doing it for twelve years, and I still think it's a hard thing to do. We a hard thing to test, even though we've been trying to improve. But also, it's also hard in terms of um, you know just just making sure you have the right person. Um, yeah, what did that? What Jerome? Curious for you, like, was there some particular attributes that stood out? When you read the blog post first away, you're like you were like, ah, oh, I can totally resonate with yeah. this more than I, the other I one. The exact the exact thing that really was like, oh, that's me, is is always asking why. Like, why yeah. are we doing this? Why are we doing this instead of that? Or like why can't we try this? Or like why mm. like why don't we have this other data point? Like I was that I feel like I would always annoy our PO at the time. <laughs> it was, he was great, he was excellent. And I think that's I think the idea actually of this shared brain is is why I think it's so important to have people like engineers like me on teams. I'm not saying I'm amazing, but having people on the team to ask these questions or to to, to challenge people, I think um, I think challenge is good, and I think sometimes not arguing, but sort of disagreeing on things is also healthy. Um, yeah, so, yeah, the creative I, conflict process. Yeah, totally. And I feel that, and I felt that in that blog post i was that i'm that guy on the team that's always asking why like why are we mm. doing this why is this important um yeah so I, I just found that super helpful so if anyone if there are any other engineers out there that maybe have an interest in product maybe it's a good place to, to mm. start mm. um because i think it was what i also found super helpful and i, I shared the post with our pms here um was what i thought was really great about that blog post was it was it gave tips to pms um on how best to to work with product engineers mm, or mm. engineers like this, and I thought that was mint, Nate. So yeah, because I think I think PMs can find it intimidating. Like I remember when I first joined the Confluence team, there were twelve people working on Confluence, or some fifteen or something like that. And I would say uh, this is typical in most startups. Most of the engineers there who um, Confluence didn't have a PM at the time, th they are they're playing the product role anyway, and so they all have a shared brain. They're all highly opinionated. Uh, they all have a vision of where it should head, et cetera. And so I came in going, I actually, what, what do I do here? Like, I remember feeling quite intimidated and challenged. I actually think that made me a better product manager in the long run after I realized they're focusing on, they're not challenging me as an individual, they're challenging the ideas. And um, you know what I found fascinating, Jerome, is I've, I've heard the opposite feedback from, I guess I've interviewed a lot of customers on how they build products. And fortunately or unfortunately, I call it the Steve Jobs model, still exists in many organizations where there is a, a big, some organizations with the culture where there is a, a, a visionary person, and you get this in most companies, but it is command and control. It's like he or, he or she says, we're building this solution. They are, you know, and everyone just follows orders. And it, uh, that model does work. Like, I mean, look at the Steve Jobs model, you know, I just think there's not many Steve Jobs in the world. And in reality, the team is more powerful than the individual. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I found a lot of people have said this blog post has challenged some internal cultural norms. You know, like I've spoken to a few people that work at 
some very big famous consumer and B2B SaaS companies and most of the engineering teams and the PMs follow orders from a, from a, a, a stakeholder that gives a, a solution. Um, and and um, that's how it is. And it, it might work for some, it's just, I, man, th that model doesn't scale very well if that person goes or, totally. or something. Or, yeah, I think, I think yeah. the worst part is, I'm not sure, like I never met Steve Jobs, but from what I hear, he was quite difficult to work with. Yeah, the, drive. <laughs> the culture in the teams, from what I hear at the time, like I hear the people that did work in these early, you know, in the glory days of Apple at the time, like apparently it was quite a um, challenging yeah. environment to be in. So I don't know, like it, it, I feel like this shared brain idea actually sounds, it sounds like a better place to work, honestly. Um, yes. I would say it's harder. It's harder because it, um, it, 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 you, there's more people problems. Like, you know, someone always reminds me, uh, actually our founders, building software is largely a people problem. Like it's getting a collective group of people aligned on something commonly to get an outcome. And, and too many times we think of building software as a body shop, like as in someone has an idea, get some engineers to just build it for you. And it, it's, and in reality, it's not like people's personalities come out of their products. Like the, the decisions are made and, and, and trade-offs are made and, and it happens that way. Yeah. Totally. I feel like we have time for one more question and it's something you would have just, you sort of just hinted at um, a second ago. The idea of PM scaling themselves, mm. do you see that as a way, like, does that imply that PMs work across multiple products or, or do you, how do you, what did you mean when you said scaling? Yeah. Um, it, the desire of scaling yourself, I think has to, has to come from building a, from building a better product. I honestly, let's be honest here. I think there's another desire, which is like, I want a promotion. I want to move up the ladder. And so there's that desire as well. And maybe you need to play off both desires to get to the outcome. But, um, but generally speaking, I think the ones that do it well are like, hey, the best way I can solve this problem for customers is to get my team along on the journey and and and, and a t team involved. Um, so I, I think that's where the, the desire has to, has to come from. Over time, what that might look like on a big product, you may have uh, a PM that's responsible for multiple feature areas. You know, you know. To give an example for us, Confluence has like twelve PMs or something, and they work in different areas of the product, etc. So they might work in multiple areas. Or for smaller company organizations, there might be a PM taking on multiple products, uh, etc. But um, you still may have a PM allocated as a point person for a stream of work, but they may not be playing the captain role as much. They, an engineer might be playing a captain; they're playing more of the support role. Of like, hey, let me know how I can help. And those are areas where either, there are often areas where the team has a shared brain. And that means as a PM, they can move on and help another team build a shared brain. And they may still be responsible for two teams or be the go-to person for that PM uh, and expand their scope that way. So I think that's that's where the desire you know needs to come from, but it does mean that they can own multiple areas of a large product or own multiple products over time. Um, yeah, is that was that what you were getting at? Sorry, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's exactly. It sounds sounds very interesting. It sounds way way down the line for me. <laughs> yeah, and, but Jerome, I will, will say that I often find people um, uh, every project I've worked on, I you go through the same cycle again. So I, um, you know, at Atlassian right now, I'm working on a new product, and I, I joined this team, and we're a new team. There's only five of us. You go back to square one, right? So like every new thing you go on, you go back to square one. You go back in. You get your hands. Uh, dirty, you know, deliberately, you're, you're trying to build a shared brain together. And now you, then you move to a stage where you're like, okay, there's context. How do I, we're now growing as a team. How do I give everyone the same context so that they can op make faster decisions, better decisions, um, and, you know, and all that. So, and then I've just, you know, personally, I've done this loop like 20 times over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, whatever. Like it just, it feels like a repetitive loop that keeps happening over and over again. Yeah, that sounds exciting. Yeah. Cool. I think we're just about out of time. Um, was there anything anything else you wanted to chat about? Or uh, no, like I think um, I guess folk, there's a clear theme on this podcast. Folks wanting interested about moving to product management or just starting in product management, um, uh, particularly from engineering roles. Um, yeah, just uh, in, in, to want to remind like remind folks that have the anxiety of making the switch um 
there's no secret magic to it. Like there, to my knowledge, there probably is. There's no like sort of like uh, yeah, I can go to university and get and get a bachelor of product management, right? I, I think it it is definitely something that be, can be trained in in anyone without a doubt. But they're probably you can see that you talk to a growth person, they see everything as funnels. Like there's an acquisition, retention, you know, etc. I think you'll talk to a product person, and some of them will also see everything as a product, right? Like you can see your life as a product. You know, there are different you know versions of you as you grow up, and there's different chapters and different problems to be solved at different stages of your life, right? You can see your existing job as a product. So if you start to incorporate that mindset. I, uh, in a lot of what you do, I think um, you can find how you can grow in product management without having necessarily be in it, but also frame and work with employ future employers to frame how you are effectively already doing some of this job, which is what a lot of the folks that are non-technical product managers uh, at Alassian have, have done, is that they've demonstrated how they're almost effectively doing that job, right, in, in, in some way. Um, but yeah, like I just leave people with that. I think people get intimidated going, oh, it's like a ivory tower kind of thing. <laughs> I'll, I'll, oh, sorry, Jerome. The last thing I'll say is it's a very, it, without a doubt, this is probably the most stressful role I've ever had. <laughs> just to like, hey, last few minutes of the podcast, maybe talk you out of this thing. Yeah, talk um, it. It, it, because it's a never ending. So, and, um, and, and you have no authority, like no one reports to you, right? So you, you're trying to influence without authority, like, uh, in everything that you do. It's definitely the most stressful role I've had. It's, it's also the most satisfying. Um, and you need to learn how to manage your stress and you you work that out uh, over time because, you know, everything, you know, no one ever gets to the deathbed and wishes they work more hours, right? Like, so it's about finding that that right balance, but yeah. Yeah, awesome. If you're not Thank freaked you. out, keep looking into it. <laughs> I am freaked out, but I'm going to do it anyway. I think, I think that's, yeah, how on, yeah. that's how we grow, right? So. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Honestly, it's been so good. Um, well, thanks for having me. And, next time and thanks you... for sharing your story as well, Jerome. I think, you know, people sharing I'm going through this journey makes it feel other people can go through this journey too. I hope so. And I hope, yeah, I hope so. I hope people listening, I hope even if one person out there hears this and it helps, I'm, I'll be pretty stoked. But yeah, thank you so much. And definitely next time you're passing through Wollongong, let us know. We'll... <laughs> Go for a beer. We'll get Nick and Dave to pay. Sounds good. I'm all up for it. Awesome. Thank you so much. See you, mate. Take care. Catch you later.